Thank you again, Dr. Cohen. So Dr. Cross and I are now going to talk about refractory proctitis novel approaches to a difficult problem. Our case is a 31-year-old woman with ulcerative proctitis uh, currently on mesalamine 4 8 grams daily with a 1 gram by rectum at night uh, who presents with increasing symptoms. So she reports two bowel movements per day with frank hematochesia, passing clots, and mucus um, with cramping lower abdominal pain and mild urgency. She denies nighttime awakenings or incontinence. Uh, she's been using mesalamine nightly for the past week without improvement, so she starts hydrocortisone foam and undergoes a colonoscopy. Her colonoscopy shows moderately active ulcerative proctitis. The uh, pictures at the top and the bottom left uh, show her rectum, and the bottom right is a representative image of the rest of her exam. And so, Dr. Cross, how would you manage this patient? So I think, uh, I think David maybe didn't like me when he assigned this because I found it to be a very difficult topic to do. I'd rather do mucosal healing. Um, but this is not an uncommon common problem. I think the issue conceptually with me is I don't typically parse out proctitis from other, from left-sided or extensive. I just sort of lump it all together. I think we have a number of different thoughts about uh, ulcerative proctitis patients that truly have isolated disease. One, there's sort of this notion that there might be this concurrent IBS overlap in patients that you can treat them well, that there's very little inflammation, but they still seem to be particularly bothered by chronic symptoms. The other thing is that historically patients with proctitis symptoms will often have non-classic symptoms, so they're not going to tell you they have 10 to 15 bloody stools a day, but if you ask them how, they may say two, but if you ask them how many times they sit on the toilet, they may say 10 to 15, so trying to tease that out. Um, when you're thinking about ulcerative proctitis, just like any other form of ulcerative colitis, the goals of therapy are the same. There seems to be this notion also that ulcerative proctitis patients uh, are a, they are a milder group, but they tend to be undertreated. So I wanted to emphasize that the treatment goals are exactly the same. We want to induce clinical remission, avoid toxicity of therapy, uh, maintain steroid-free remission. Now, whether that means avoiding all topical steroids, maybe that would be a topic for some debate. Enhance quality of life, um, prevent progression of disease, um, and decrease uh, healthcare utilization. Just like any other form of colitis, some important considerations. We want to rule out C. diff. This patient doesn't sound like they have C. diff, but be very reasonable to exclude. We are I already touched on the concurrent IBS overlap in these patients. Other factors that can be exacerbating symptoms, Anthony didn't mention concurrent use of NSAIDs or antibiotics, but certainly teasing those out can be important. Um, we're going to talk about disease extension in patients and how often that happens. And prognosis is one thing, but the severity of symptoms is also important. So getting a sense of how the severe the symptoms are at that point in time will help guide your choice of treatment. Um, this is, um, I think many of the faculty have um, ongoing disease activity indices that they use in clinical practice, but many of you probably don't use formal indices. There are some simple things that you can use. This is a guide I give to referring doctors in Maryland when I'm speaking to them. Obviously, remission is no symptoms. This patient seemed, unless, unless the patient's reporting 10 trips to just sit on the toilet with tenesmus, this patient seems to have more mild disease activity. Uh, no limitations in activity, so patient, the patient's not missing work or social engagements. A patient with more moderate disease has impaired activity, missing days of work or missing social engagements. In Baltimore, patients always miss work before they miss social engagements. And then the severe patients are the ones that are housebound, bathroom-bound, or in the hospital. So going back to our case, this patient's probably a mild to moderately active patient. So let's change the story a little bit. Let's say this is an acute onset presentation of proctitis. What things would you think about? And it doesn't have to be acute, but it could be subacute as well. So let's say the diagnosis wasn't well established. So there are some non-infectious and infectious mimics of proctitis. Uh, going back to when we were, when Gill was risk stratifying, remember patients with Crohn's proctitis are actually at high risk for a disabling disease course. Those are your patients that need colostomy and ileostomy that develop anorectal strictures. So we want to make sure the diagnosis is truly ulcerative proctitis and not Crohn's. Uh, 
Uh, two weeks ago, I saw a patient who's been suffering with solitary rectal ulcer syndrome for about eight years and still hasn't gotten definitive treatment. Um, that's something that can certainly masquerade as ulcerative proctitis. Ischemic and traumatic injury, we don't see very often. You're going to see that more in-house. And I think the most common cause, at least in our center, is uh, balloon ulcers from patients that have continent balloons placed in the ICU. Uh, radiation injury, again, we don't see much anymore, and I don't rotate at the VA, but certainly in our veteran population, we used to see a fair amount of radiation proctitis. Uh, Bichette's, and I haven't, maybe the faculty have seen this, but I haven't seen medication-induced ulcerative proctitis with those agents. I think the infectious uh, mimics are worth spending at least a minute on. Um, we already mentioned C. diff. The other infections aren't, aren't particularly known for causing proctitis. Uh, Yersinia, in fact, is more of a mimicker of ileal Crohn's. Um, what about systemic infections, particularly in those that are sexually active or that have high-risk sexual behavior? Things to think about are syphilis, um, herpes infection, and uh, chlamydia, particularly LGV, which has been associated with outbreaks of proctitis in men that have sex with men that are HIV positive. So you often get an alert that there's an outbreak in your area. Um, and you should be aware of this. I've seen one case of concurrent proctitis and hepatitis in a patient who was diagnosed with uh, acute onset EBV infection. And certainly in your immunosuppressed patients, thinking about CMV, there's a recent review from Mayo Clinic showing that we probably undersample to detect CMV. It's requ requiring about 10 to 11 biopsies to identify CMV, so be aware of that. So in a patient with new onset symptoms, whether they be acute or subacute, some red flags that would steer you away from a diagnosis of ulcerative proctitis would be a history of prior malignancy with pelvic radiation. You'd want to think about radiation proctitis. Any unusual travel to developing countries or food exposures, uh, men having sex with men, particularly those that are HIV positive, you would definitely think of an infectious etiology. Those that are immune suppressed, you would think about um, CMV. And if you have a patient who has a lot of straining and defecatory disorder, you want to keep in mind uh, solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. So let's move to ulcerative proctitis because this patient had an established diagnosis. What's the natural history? Clearly, ulcerative proctitis, isolated ulcerative proctitis, has a good, is a good prognostic, um, is uh, less aggressive, lower risk. Um, the progression over time, over, over 20 years, is about 30 to 40 percent of patients will progress beyond the splenic flexure. So most patients will uh, maintain isolated proctitis. Those that do extend tend to extend uh, within five years of diagnosis. And this is older data. These are looking at older cohorts. It's probably even better now, but the actual rate of colectomy in patients with isolated proctitis is quite low, only 4 to 5 percent. And it's well known that patients not only with proctitis, but with proctosigmoiditis are not at increased risk for colorectal cancer. Despite these findings, despite the excellent prognosis, it doesn't mean that we should undertreat patients with ulcerative proctitis because only the rectum's involved. And I would think, and I think that in my referral practice, that's one of the common things that I see is patients are dripping five ASAs out of, their, out of their rectum and they're still suffering and they haven't had escalation of treatment. This has been shown already. This is the um, AGA clinical pathway for ulcerative colitis. And I show this not to go over the whole algorithm again, but if you look at the low colectomy risk patients, so that's our ulcerative proctitis patient given the limited extent, you can see that the patients on high dose oral 5 ASA and rectal 5 ASA and still symptomatic. Well, I lost my balloon there, but basically the, pa the pathway suggests going to alternative therapy, which would be prednisone, a biologic such as an anti-TNF or anti-integrin. Um, so it's completely acceptable to step up therapy in a patient that's not doing well. What additional uh, diagnostic considerations should we think about? And again, I really had to try to dig to find this. Um, we know that routine biomarkers in practice, such as white count, hemoglobin, CRP, sed rate, and albumin, can be used to monitor disease activity, both in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. In one study, uh, 22 to 55 percent of patients had abnormalities in these routine biomarkers. The ones that were most commonly abnormal in ulcerative colitis 
or the SED rate first and the CRP second. They correlated fairly well, but they didn't correlate well in patients with left-sided or distal disease. So in patients with distal colitis, the CRP and the SED rate didn't correlate very well with active disease. So a rule of thumb is you can have a patient with horrible symptoms, 15 stools a day with absolutely completely normal labs, and they can have horrible endoscopic inflammation. So remember, your distal colitis patients may not have derangement in their biomarkers. What about calprotectin for uh, isolated proctitis? I really wasn't able to find much on this. This was a very small study of 60 patients. Uh, 20 had isolated proctitis, and over 30 had extensive disease. The mean, and all of these patients either were newly diagnosed or had a relapse of disease, so they were all symptomatic. The mean fecal calprotectin level was 600. In the ulcerative proctitis patients, the mean was only 86, but you can see the interquartile range was fairly broad. In the left-sided colitis patients, it was actually over 2,000. In the extensive colitis patients, it was 740, but you can see a lot of overlap. So there's a suggestion here that maybe your isolated proctitis patients may not have quite a um, strong or quite a, uh, as high an increase in fecal calprotectin as those with more extensive disease. So more, more to come on that, I'm sure. What about conventional treatment? Uh, now this is really for distal colitis. It's not necessarily for isolated proctitis, and I'm going to cite two meta-analyses. Compared to placebo, rectal uh, 5 ASAs are eight times to five times more likely to result in clinical and endoscopic remission, respectively, so they're very, very effective for distal colitis. Rectal 5 ASAs are superior to placebo in maintenance of remission. Um, however, in this, in this meta-analysis, there was no difference between rectal and oral 5 ASA for maintenance. And in one um, fairly large study of over 200 patients, they compared uh, rectal steroids to mesalamine and there was to topical uh, mesalamine and there was no difference. Um, so really no uh, superior efficacy of topical steroids in patients with distal disease. This is a slide you've probably seen at least 50 times. This is a small study by, Peter, uh, by Michael Safdie um, comparing uh, rectal mesalamine to oral mesalamine or combination. Look to the far right here at week six, and the take-home message is that the combination of oral and topical 5-ASA is more effective than either therapy alone. So combination therapy in distal colitis is a combination of oral and topical 5-ASA, not anti-TNF and a thiopurine. So I'm going to go over a couple, um, a couple slides of conventional therapy. This is looking at budesonide MMX, which was relatively recently approved for the treatment of ulcerative colitis. Um, here you're looking at placebo in blue, um, the approved dose of MMX 9 milligram in red, 6 milligrams in green, and the comparator mesalamine 2.4 in purple. And you can see that in general, uh, Budesonide outperforms the others as far as remission, response, and symptom resolution. So this would be a drug that we can use in our ulcerative proctitis patients. Unfortunately, all of those patients were excluded from this study. So patients with isolated proctitis were not included. This is a summary slide that looks at the pivotal, three pivotal clinical trials for each of the anti-TNF biologics that we have available for the treatment of ulcerative colitis. Infliximab in blue, adalimumab in red, and golimumab in green. You can see response, remission, and mucosal healing to the far right. But again, all three studies excluded patients with isolated proctitis. And then lastly, I think you're going to see the common theme. This slide, David showed this slide before. This is looking at uh, Gemini 1 with ulcerative colitis, and it's sorted out by TNF naive patients and TNF exposed, showing that vetalizumab maintenance therapy is superior to placebo. But again, patients with ulcerative proctitis were excluded. So I think that all the conventional therapies that we have do work for ulcerative proctitis, and we're really forced to extrapolate from clinical trials. Uh, but there may be something particular to our ulcerative proctitis patients that's slightly different. Let's move into specific treatments for UP. Uh, budesonide foam is also newly approved treatment. Uh, in this study, patients with mild to moderate proctitis, isolated, of course, to the rectum, were randomized to either placebo or two milligrams twice daily of budesonide for two weeks. 
then two milligrams daily for four weeks, and you're looking here at a six-week assessment time point, placebo in blue, budesonide in red. You can see that budesonide foam outperformed placebo by almost a two-to-one ratio, and when you look at complete resolution of bleeding and mucosal healing, budesonide foam was also more effective. So a new agent, uh, particularly easy for patients to handle given that it's a foam and not a full enema, so it can be uh, fairly effective. Now this is a small study, uh, not with the approved product, but with a budesonide foam compared to a hydrocortisone foam, which we've used a lot pr previously. Overall, the treatment success rate between hydrocortisone foam and budesonide foam was not different. However, and you look at, if you look at patients that have been treated previously with a topical 5-ASA, uh, budesonide foam was more effective than hydrocortisone. So if a payer, uh, if you're getting some pushback from a payer about which to use, maybe the battle to fight is patients that have failed prior topical therapy with a 5-ASA. They may do a little better with the budesonide foam. So to summarize, um, overall patients with ulcerative proctitis at diagnosis have a better prognosis than those with more extensive UC. However, that should not be a reason to undertreat patients. In patients with new onset disease without an established diagnosis, um, consider mimics, both non-infectious and infectious mimics. The most effective standard treatment for patients with mild to moderate disease is a combination of oral and topical therapy. Consider steroid topical therapy, either hydrocortisone foam or budesonide foam in those not responding. And actually, uh, Ted Bayless at Hopkins gave me a tip at a meeting of going through a compounding pharmacy and combining, combining mesalamine enemas with two milligrams of budesonide, which anecdotally can be very, very effective with patients with refractory disease. And despite the lack of evidence from clinical trials, I would not hesitate to use immune suppressants and biologics in those with um, refractory proctitis. Thank you.